Hi, I'm Shane Hurlbut. I'm an ASC cinematographer, and I wanted to kind of talk to you about something. Getting started in this industry is almost impossible. And my wife, Lydia, and I, 14 years ago, created a resource called Filmmakers Academy to make it possible. We saw a lot of gatekeeping in this industry and not a lot of sharing knowledge. So we wanted to pull back the curtain, give you confidence, teach you all the necessary skills to be an amazing, successful filmmaker, and package it all on this online resource that you have at your fingertips, on set, on your phone, on your laptop, whatever it is. So we're going to give you $50. So if you go into the show notes, click the link and hit the promo code FAPOD50, you're going to get $50 on your first year of an all access membership. And I cannot wait for you to join our immense and immersive community at Filmmakers Academy, where we network, we share knowledge, we just bond as this huge filmmaking uh, resource to ignite your creativity and push you beyond your boundaries. I cannot wait to see you in the Academy, and let's get to the podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Inner Circle Podcast. I'm Lydia Hurlba, your host, and I am joined today by Brendan Sweeney, our FA team member. Welcome, Brendan. How's it going? And we are so lucky to have in studio today, Rudy Mancuso, the director of Musica, and Shane Hurlbut, ASC cinematographer on that film. It is out on Prime Video and just had the world premiere at South by Southwest. And so Brendan and I are going to talk all things Musica. So let's get into it. Welcome. We're so excited to have you, Rudy. We're so excited to be here. Look Absolutely. My, what an and, awesome introduction. Yeah. <laughs> and Shane. I love you. So, um, Rudy, this film is absolutely extraordinary. And I think unlike anything any of us have ever experienced because it's a little bit, it's a love story. It's a musical. Mm -hmm. The music is such a part of, it's the soul of the film. And I know how much you put into that as a musician. And so um, I think what really touched me the most other than the love story was really the theme of being true to yourself and and not constantly trying to meet the needs of others mm. to find happiness and joy. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's it's very authentic to my own experience. And the theme sort of found itself uh, as as we were making it. Um, Reliving a lot of, of those experiences was interesting, um, a bit transformative, I mm -hmm. would say. But um, the themes that weren't highlighted early on became highlighted after after uh, shooting. Mm -hmm. We were all learning as we were going because I think we were attempting to do a lot of things that none of us had ever done. Uh, certainly, certainly me. I, and I don't know. I don't want to speak for Shane. But <laughs> <Yeah>. we, all, <laughs> we, well, we all tried things that... Um, we had no business trying. And I think something that was so great with Musica, and this is where we really want to pick your background. I actually grew up in New Jersey as well. And I feel like New oh, Jersey, where, yeah, where? I grew up in Belvedere, New Jersey, okay. which was kind of closer to the Poconos. So Got right it. along. Yeah, Jersey's big. Yeah, it is big. A lot of people think it's small, but it's not that small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a big part of this film and what I thought was so beautiful is it really captures, and Shane and you both did such an amazing job, the camaraderie of New Jersey, especially that part of New Jersey where you lived in. Mm -hmm. What was it like just Talk to us about your background, even before this film was just a concept, what that part of your life was like and how it really just influenced you as an artist. Yeah, I mean, as you'll see in the film, um, I, I grew up primarily with with my mother, my Brazilian mother, and it was a small town called Glen Ridge in New Jersey. And the neighboring town was or city was Newark, but specifically where we'd spend most of our time 
was this little pocket tight knit neighborhood known as the Ironbound, which still exists today. And when I was growing up, now it's it's changed a bit, but when I was growing up, it was almost entirely Brazilian, Portuguese, Hispanic, and the, the main language spoken was Brazilian Portuguese. So it wow. almost felt like mm-hmm. you're in a mini Brazil. I mean, to speak English in, it, it, within that like few mile radius mm-hmm. was very strange. You didn't hear English. If you spoke English, uh, you got strange looks. Um, and everything in the film is was authentic to my experience. I would go mm-hmm. to that sa- that fish market, and we had the luxury of shooting at the actual fish market that yeah, I would go that's to. That's awesome. We had the luxury of shooting at the actual restaurant that I would frequent, um, uh, the actual city streets, and we even got to shoot in my actual mother's home where I grew up. Yeah, um, that was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Shane somehow um, made the most of a very limited space mm-hmm. yeah. but but it was worth it because i could i can look back at it and say i shot in my actual childhood home not a lot of filmmakers uh, and actors get to say that and yeah. and i think that the roles that you took on and we're going to dive into so many topics so um for for those you know do not leave this episode because rudy okay you directed you acted you composed, you sang, you had a puppet, all you wrote, and you wrote. Thank you. All there's so many roles that you're playing, and it's mm-hmm. based on your life story or a a version of your life. Did you give say. yourself credit for puppeteering? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the one credit I forgot. Um, yeah, no, I I signed up to wear all these hats not because. Um, not because I I felt I I was the only one who could, but it was the only way to make sure that the experience was as authentic as it could possibly be. Mm-hmm. And it's not like all these different departments are far removed from each other. To me, it's one big umbrella. With a story like this, directing was composing, composing was writing, and writing was acting. They were all so heavily intertwined, more mm-hmm. than ever. It wasn't like we 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 defer to a music department to handle all the music. No, the music is l- quite literally happening in the middle of the dialogue, in the middle of the scene. Um, because they're so heavily intertwined, I-, I didn't feel like I was wearing multiple hats. It was all just one big hat. But we would joke a lot of times on set where it's like, this movie doesn't have a director because I was in every single scene as the actor. And it was certainly challenging, but I think for this story necessary. Right. I agree. And I think... I have two parents that are musicians. I think let's start with the music and then Brendan, please dive in as my cinephile here. (laughs) I think a good place for us to start too is I really want to paint the picture of what musica is. That way people know what the musica, Musica. thank you. (laughs) Musica is, yeah. (laughs) So people understand the project. If you could give our best, like give your best elevator pitch and then we'll go into some of the technical details. I would really love to hear that. Cool. Happy to. Musica is a story loosely based on my life and experience about a young guy trying to come to terms with the reality of his life, trying to juggle family, culture, relationship, relationships, all through this synesthetic perspective. The character and myself have a condition called synesthesia. There are various different types of synesthesia. And this one is a very music oriented um, form of iteration of the condition and, and and the film is all told through that lens. So um, it's a love story as much as it is a coming of age. And the twist is this strange musical perspective that I had never really seen before. Uh, and that's what, mm-hmm. why we got so excited. And when did you start having the ideas for this project? And I know that you and Shane both met on Rim of the World. That's kind of what I surmised, right? Yeah. During that period when you both started working together, I know you were acting, Shane was shooting the movie. Was this project in mind? Were you working towards this? I know that you wrote the short film before actually producing the feature. But when did you start to say, man, I really want to put this on the big screen? This story has been in my mind for as long as I could remember, I want to say over a decade mm-hmm. um, before I even started making mm-hmm. stories and content on the internet, uh, I knew I wanted to one day make a film uh, through this bizarre musical perspective. Um, 
and I knew I wanted to be loosely based on my own life because uh, as a Brazilian American, Brazilian culture and the Portuguese language, in my opinion, are very underrepresented. So this is an opportunity to do both. Mm -hmm. um, it really took a uh, wizard and scientist like Shane to pull <laughs> some of this stuff off because it was, I felt it was exciting to him because visually there was an opportunity to really dream up all kinds of bizarre pieces. Um, and sonically, there was an opportunity to do so much uh, musically. Um, the fun part was figuring out how those two work together. Work together. Yeah. yeah, I remember the first time Shane showed me the short film that you did for Musica. And I've known Shane for, I don't know what, like eight years now. And he's done so many projects through that. But what was one of the like greatest moments was Shane was like, look at this project, Rudy Mancuso. I was like, oh, well, yeah, I know him from all of your previous work. And he was like, just look at the creativity in this short that he really wants to bring to life and he's considering me to shoot it. And I really want, kind of want to speak to that moment, mm -hmm. Shane, because I did think it was quite unique in where your mind was at before you guys were really even in the talks to doing it together. What was the first thing that you thought of with Musica? So this has only happened Musica. two times in my whole career, okay? Where I, on Drumline, I got sent a script and um, the producer called me up and said, and I happened to be in Kansas City. Uh, I was a director cameraman on a children's hospital spot. And he goes, have you read the script? And I go, Tim, I'm, shoot I'm directing this spot. I'm, you know, I I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm into this saints go marching in bullshit, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, I just like the people drumming and going in and tubas flying. And I, I just, uh, he goes, where are you? I'm like, Jesus, uh, I'm at a Marriott and what's the address? And, you know, so I give him all the address and he goes, we'll talk tomorrow. And I literally walked in coming back from that uh, day of shooting. And there was one of those AV roller carts, because this is back in 2002, right? 2003, where they rolled in the, the TV with the little VHS deck <laughs> And there was a uh, tape there, and it said, play me. What? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I was like, what the hell is this? So I put it in, and it is a drum line doing a drum battle. And I was running for the freaking phone. Mm. And I had that same aha moment when, you know, Stephen, you know, Stephen Bellow goes, Shane, I got this kind of quirky little movie. I don't know <laughs> if you're going to be up for it, but I, I'd love to see what you think. You know, I, it's not going to be the biggest budget thing, but I think there's something there. He sent me that sizzle. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I couldn't get to the phone quick enough. <laughs> I was like, this is so out of the box and so unique. And then when you and I started to do those processes where we did those three hours blocks, we did yeah. seven in a row. Yeah, remember, we would wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and you were in New Jersey and oh, I was in LA mm -hmm. and we just sit there for three hours of block and we would do it via Zoom and we would literally be saying, okay, Oh, let's just mount the, you know, bed to the wall. And we'll, you know, it's like we were, and I'm like drawing little storyboard pictures. And then I'm like putting myself up against the wall and we're co conceptualizing all the shots. And then once we had that baked, oh my God, it was so good because we had planned the whole movie out from beginning to end. And yeah. that's very few times that I ever get that from a director. Mm -hmm. So this level of energy and enthusiasm was was uh, was and is very contagious. I mean, when when we met for the officially met for the first time in regards to this project, um, I was so blown away uh, by by his his uh, enthusiasm just based off the pages and the sizzle, and and I figured if if I could get everyone on this project to be as excited to be a part of it as this guy mm -hmm. um then we'll we'll create something an environment that's really special and infectious i 
obviously knew about Shane's work and I'm I was a massive fan of a lot of the things that he did and he you know he this, he was a person who shoots big movies mm -hmm. um and this film by no me I wouldn't consider it although I feel at times it, it could feel big it's not a big film we, we we don't have a huge budget we don't have a ton of time we're shooting during covid there were so many obstacles and parameters yeah. that we had to navigate and the level of prep that that you guide me through because I'd never done this before, uh, uh, not on this scale. I mean, right. it, usually it's I have an idea on Monday, I shoot it on Tuesday, it's out on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now we're talking about schematics. And I'm, I, I had to. I don't even know what schematics means. Um, and uh, and and I think we're able. We're only able to pull off a lot of these set pieces and mm -hmm. scenes and sequences because of that level of prep. Be, I was just going to say, and I was able to witness the laughter, the the creative, because I'm, I'm hearing this coming, you know, emanating. Because her office is right behind, you know, we're in dormers in our bedroom. We have two offices in there. So, <laughs> so she I was over here. I, yeah, the I whole would time. Hear, I would <laughs> hear, hear this. <laughs> <laughs> and then my son comes in and at the end of one call, you go, Shane, we're going to change the world. And then <laughs> Miles heard that when he walked in to talk to Lydia. And then he would say that all the time. <laughs> I said that? Yeah. Oh, man, I hate me. Um, but it was so special. And I think that people have to understand. And we're going to dive into this, the, the depth of this movie from a musical standpoint, from a cinematography standpoint, mm -hmm. from all the layers. But I think that the prep as you said, and I think that we really need to hit this point because it really matters, mm -hmm. is foundational given the fact that you were doing live music, that the amount of shooting time was really cut down. Mm -hmm. And because it was it was being recorded live. And we had all the background rhythm performers that we had to get uh, all dressed. And then we had to then get them to lunch and then back from lunch and then back dressed again. And in the, oh, yeah, it was a it's like we had a five and a half hours to shoot yeah, basically I've, every day. And I think it would be interesting to hear how you obviously had an original approach with the short film of Musica. And now you're trying to bridge the gap and make this into a feature film. Let's talk about where your headspace was starting even before Shane came in. What was the inspiration? And then once Shane came in, how did that ultimately change? Did you still find yourself making a similar product or ultimately with Shane's influence? I assume that it got better, which I know it did. But what were the variables, at least as you as the director? Well, the, I, the vision never changed. Mm. What Shane helped me do was just elevate everything and, and reimagine a lot of pieces um, to fit m in a more cinematic world. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'll, all of my material beforehand was very DIY um, and very makeshift, and it's part of I think the the uh, the charm of a lot of content on the internet yeah. uh, from a lot of creators is is the fact that they are so limited in their resources, and that's something that I that I uh, I'm so glad I had the experience of doing. I mean, mm. there was a time when I was making videos that were six seconds long and had to be shot on a phone. You couldn't edit them, you couldn't add music, you couldn't do anything. It was all done in mm -hmm. real time in this six second looping video app. If the take wasn't good, you had to start again from scratch. Um, so. It was a great education. So imagine I come up with this one sequence in my head, and then I meet with somebody who's used to doing it in a much grander way. Um, it was really just uh, taking these makeshift ideas and elevating them in ways that I didn't know was possible. And a lot of times they weren't, um, but we still <laughs> we still somehow figured it out. Um, I don't remember your question. No, I think no. That's really no. spot on, Lydia. I don't know if you want to add to it, but it's just seeing where you were coming from a director working with someone like Shane and how you were able to bridge that gap from short film to long form. Because the cool thing is, it's like we're uh, different generations as well, mm -hmm. and you know, it's one thing that I, uh, you know, I, I always consider myself a five year old. 
right? <laughs> it's like I've never grown up past five years old. So, you know, any younger directors, I immediately bond with with that generation, that time, because I'm I I try to 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 soak up what your creativity like a sponge and then I kind of shake it all up and try to figure out how to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that was what was so inspiring to me is because you're like, Oh yeah, the, the Diego's going to talk. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> Diego's a puppet, by the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah Diego's a puppet in the story. And then all of a sudden you threw that down, like on our third, uh, three hour call. You're <laughs> like, yeah, what if I think Diego should talk? And I, and then he basically becomes your life coach throughout mm -hmm. the whole film. Mm -hmm. And this was an, an element where when you said it, I was like, oh, hell yeah, of yeah. course he's going to talk. You know, <laughs> it's like, and you start, you kept on pushing me to uncomfortable uh, places that that's where, that's my sweet spot. You know, that's where I love to always create from something that you've not really done before. You're, you're always trying to, my God, how can we reinvent the wheel? How can we, you know, mm -hmm. slice it a new way? It's like, and as long as all that is done from the heart and the soul of the message of the film and the emotion, if we're doing that and we're only shining spotlights on that emotion and everything mm -hmm. that we did, like. I'll never forget the other thing. It's like he would come up with these crazy ideas. He's like, but it would be, and there were curveballs, which was awesome, right? He's like, I want all the lights to turn off in the at Rutgers. And I was like, well, shit, we, I don't have anything that can turn off. I, I, I didn't plan on this. He goes, yeah, I want all the lights to turn off and a spotlight goes on me. And it's like, we had kind of talked about the spotlight, but not all the lights turning off. So then it's like, okay, so I got somebody over on a light switch, like literally on a light switch. You <laughs> yeah. Know? I was and, like, why not? Why don't you just turn them off? And Shane's like, um, this is not how this works. <laughs> it's not. It's not just turn it off and on. It's a little more complicated than that. And so, like, we would, in a weird way, educate each other. I would educate you on um, to just be simpler. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'd educate me on um, no, right. It's not possible. <laughs> uh, but there's this. So that was the other thing. Um, you know, I I joke, but but I. I I don't think I ever actually heard the the words "it's not possible" or or "no" or "I don't think so" from Shane. It was always yes. It was always yes and instead of no. But other people's job was to say no, and there were some radical ideas yes. that were being pitched. And considering the fact that we had five weeks and this much money and these parameters and these locations, uh, it was a tall order, and there were a lot of unrealistic asks. But it was always yes. Mm -hmm. Shane was always saying, hell yeah, I love that idea. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. And if mm -hmm. we can't do it, let's do it anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and that's exactly, that was exactly the, the approach. And I don't think we had to fight for certain pieces that if it weren't for that attitude would have never been pulled off. I no. think that's a great testament to what the collaborative process should look like between a director and a DP. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's not a lot of communication of what that looks like historically. You know, those are the two most to a certain degree, the two most important creative minds trying to steer this ship. And I love hearing that you guys were able to meet in the middle with stuff using your years of traditional Hollywood filmmaking, your newer generation of entering into the industry through social media platforms, but still an amazing filmmaker in your own right. I think that is just amazing to be able to see that today. I agree, Brendan. And I think for those that don't know Rudy and they've literally been living under a rock <laughs> if they don't know your history on YouTube. But I think that that, you know, coming up and creating directing on YouTube, really doing the music, being you mm -hmm. right, doing it all. And then transitioning as a director to shooting your first feature film, there were so many interesting elements as an actor and a director and writer in all the roles that you played from what taking your audience from YouTube, having them get excited about Musica, which is a much longer format. Mm -hmm. Um I think there's many elements that you were able to test drive, if you will, to, to check to see if it worked for this particular project on YouTube. 
and and do a u- unusual way of like pre-screening it or friends and family screening. Um, that is so brilliant and not done. I've never seen a movie done like this. I mean, you were able to preconceive, shoot it, put it out there and see if it struck a chord. <laughs> and if it did, you were like, okay, let's incorporate this into the movie. Right. And I was able to see how it worked prior as well, because you said, oh, well, I did this. Here's the video. I did this. Here's the video. And we, I would sit there and I would just look at it. I'm like, okay, so how I, I love the DIY element to it. Let's still keep some of that uh, essence, but elevate it, but mm-hmm. then elevate it. Right. And, and how can I, can we do that? We've already, I've already seen it on YouTube. I already see the millions and millions of views. So we know this struck a chord. So how can we keep the, the, uh, soul of that Mm -hmm. idea Mm -hmm. and then just take it uh, a little higher cinematically? Yeah. No pun intended. Take it higher. (laughs) (laughs) At first, I think it was a a subconscious effort because I really, I think a, um, a lot of people who have seen anything that I've done assume that, um, social media and short form is uh comes second nature to me but i actually had to learn that form because i fell in love with music and films far before videos on social media was a thing um i really had to learn that language i'm still trying to learn it um i by no means have mastered it because i don't think it's something that one can actually master because mm-hmm. it's so mm-hmm. it's constantly changing and yeah. um and evolving, but um, I loved the challenge of telling a story in such a short amount of time, which is why I like the Vine format, six seconds. If you can tell a story in six seconds, uh, that says something about your creativity. Mm -hmm. If you can make a compelling piece of of music in six seconds, that says something about your songwriting. Um, So I was attracted to that, and then six seconds grew to 15 seconds, grew to a minute, grew to five minutes, as all these different platforms started started uh, imposing video features and then YouTube was was uh, an opportunity to make pretty much anything with very little parameters, which for a creative is a dream come true. Not the case with film and TV. Um, you have studio, you have producers, you have a lot, you have a lot more cooks. Uh, that was an education yeah. for me. But, but to, to your point, it went from a subconscious thing to a strategy. I, I realized what's my goal in life? It's to make films and music and ideally do them both simultaneously. Um, that's why I, I look up to Charlie Chaplin because he would mm-hmm. write, direct, compose, yep. and actually edit and choreograph his own material. And um, and I, I, I think it is possible to do that if, if what you're saying is, is um, if this, what you're trying, the message you're trying to convey is honest mm-hmm. uh, to who you are. So I realized what's the best way to defend myself and justify some of these ideas? Well, why don't I just do them and make sure that it resonates with people? So I, I want to say like at least half a dozen of the set pieces for the film are yes. based off of pieces I've already made a version of. And then Shane helped me and Patrick and the rest of the crew helped oh, yeah. me help me figure out how to take that concept that has already been proven but elevate it and uh cinematize it um and uh uh and and a lot of a lot of times it worked that one or that we did i have done a poor man's version of that um the puppets was a proven uh online comedy sketch huge Mm -hmm. huge uh series engagement so so when when i would write a joke and the studio would say hypothetically if they would say i don't really understand that joke let's try something else. Maybe there's an alt. Um, I could show them hours of versions of that joke. Unbelievable. And yeah. See, this is so unique. It, yeah. it really is. And what I love about it is that when, and I really want to talk about um, your process, Rudy, because I think that this is so unusual. And your process is that you're so multi-talented in a variety of ways, but also your brain works very quickly and you're 10 steps ahead. Mm -hmm. And then having to come back if people don't understand or see what you see, because you truly 
have such a gift and I think have a little bit of a different lens maybe than the average person Mm -hmm. in terms of creativity and the creative process. And so then it's having to come back and justify that with the numbers or with, you know, viewership especially as a first time director. And I think that everybody, and I am not a director. So um, everybody who's first time director, I'm sure has to justify a lot. And then getting that opportunity to direct again is even more pressure and incredibly difficult, especially if you've had a hit. Right. And I'm sure it's the same on YouTube, just in a different version, different numbers, right? But when you're dealing with studios, and my point is, is that you're seeing things, they're not convinced, especially with the one or or, or other things that you really had to fight for. Mm-hmm. And how did you very practically for all the directors out there go about doing it? And, and as a creative saying, okay, I know this is going to work. How, how was that? Uh, tricky. Yeah. Next question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, I was very lucky. Amazon, uh, really believed in the vision. They believed in me. They really trusted me and they saw the worth by analyzing years of material. I mean, I, I shot us that sizzle that short, Mm -hmm. which is a version of the opening scene of the film, um, years before the film got greenlit. But it, it was a proof of concept that proved I can I can uh, I can direct something that feels cinematic, not just something that feels um, like it was made for the internet. Um, so Amazon really supported the vision, which was huge, and I got very lucky that I got such a badass crew um, because it there were so many parameters. Um, there was so much up against the project, um, commanding a set isn't easy but i love it the hardest part was being in every scene as an actor um mm-hmm. I, I felt that i i sometimes could and I, a testament to having a great crew i felt that i couldn't be as present as i really wanted to be mm-hmm. and um and command as significantly as i could have because i also had to be in character and i also had to be <laughs> Uh, on camera and look a certain way and remember my lines. Um, so I would have liked to spend more time at the at the tech scouts. And uh, when, when we're at these certain locations, I had to either be there remotely or just trust that it was it was right to trust the crew that it would be right. Um, because I was sitting with with uh, the actors going rewriting scenes as a writer or I was rehearsing as an actor. Um, that was probably the most challenging part was was uh, directing this while also having to be the lead. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know that I'll ever do that ever again. <laughs> Did you direct yourself through scenes? Because I always know there's like Mel Gibson who would get a first AD who knows how to direct. So when he was on camera, like Braveheart, for example, mm-hmm. the first AD was always there to help him through that. And knowing you, you've done so much content where you are acting and directing it. What does that process look like? Or do you try to get someone else to help you as like Shane in that chair? Well, I did rely very heavily yeah. on on people like Shane, like my sister, who like my right hand woman, she was sitting at Video Village and I'd have to rush over to Village and look at her and based off her expression, I could tell if we got it or not. And I would do the same thing. I'd run over to Shane's little tent and I'd be like, <laughs> what do you think? Did we get it? Cause you know, and, and he would, and, and sometimes he would, he would uh, put a bit of a director's hat and say, mm-hmm. it looked great. I would get one more because of A, B and C. Um, you don't want to waste the time of watching playback uh, after every take. So sometimes you just have to trust the energy of the moment and trust the energy of the crew. And that's something that I was used to by just making videos. But mm-hmm. um, uh, I think that's the biggest distinction between making a film and 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 making a video is that uh, everything is bigger. Yeah. Every, the time mm-hmm. is more valuable. There are more uh, heads and bodies on set. There's more gear. Um, every minute counts. I don't have to tell you that time is probably by far the most valuable asset yeah um more than 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 money or or yeah. uh, uh or credits or or talented people is actually time like time was the thing that we were fighting for the most and 
it's like I think as a director of photography going into a movie like this where he was the writer, director, actor, composer, I thought to myself, I I tried to put that hat on and see how I could function with making all the day-to-day, scene-to-scene, uh, directing, you know, thinking about the script, thinking about the writing, trying to, you know, remember my lines, all that stuff. And I said, oh my God, how I can help Rudy more than anything is to literally shot list and schematic mm-hmm. every single scene so we talked it through. We designed the shot list in those meetings and continued to finesse it as locations changed and things, you know, curveballs came up. But you knew each day you got a document and that document showed where we had discussed that where you were going and where the other characters were going and the shot list around it. So you could, I wanted to just clear as much of that noise mm-hmm. away from you so you could be your most present in regards to delivering the performance and also not having to think about oh mm-hmm. did we get all the coverage did yeah, we exactly. forget that to the, exactly. you know because when you start doing that that's going to only make you trip and fall on other things yeah so i had i had that safety net um and that's huge and i think let's dive into that so is the non cinematographer in the group <laughs> How how did you make creative choices in terms of gear? Everybody wants to know. Rules of engagement, I think, are really important. Yes. Yeah. So that was one thing that we, when we talked about, I was like, you know, having the characters have these kind of rules, you know, and we we kind of created different color tones for yeah. uh, the, the characters. Yeah. So, you know, um, Isabella's character... Uh, the Brazilian was more golden and oranges and reds in her space. And then we wanted her to feel a little more raw. Handheld and grainy. Handheld and grainy. So we added a, you know, we shot at 3200 ISO on the Gemini uh, to gain that beautiful texture for day exteriors. It didn't matter what it was. Mm -hmm. We shot 3200 and you could see it. You know, so I knew we were going down a really good road when you saw the iron bound backdrop and mm-hmm. how that grain worked in the fish market, in the park and all on the street scenes. It just brought a texture to mm-hmm. it that felt Isabella. Mm-hmm. And what were right? the what did you shoot on? So we shot on the Red Gemini, uh, which I think is one of the most amazing full, you know, uh, kind of multi-format kind of camera because it's dual ISO. So it gives you uh, an amazing clean feed at 800 and then you can go 1600 or 3200 with its dual ISO and it gives you a beautiful grain uh, to the image. And because it's more of a super 35 sensor, the photo buckets are so much bigger. Mm-hmm. So it really feels like filmic grain. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not a tight sensor like the helium where it's 8K pushed into a super 35, uh, you know, envelope. It is a large, a larger format, um, you know, in 4K. So mm-hmm. it's, it's not trying to put all those 8Ks of pixels in there that are super tight. It's It's got room to breathe. Yeah. And I felt that using the dual ISO and then the combination with the Leica Sumacron mm-hmm. glass, which is not pristine, it has quirks. You know, it's mm-hmm. it distorts a little bit. It, it, has, uh, it has a character. It's not just clean. So... When we were discussing the movie on how we could develop the color structure, so Haley's character, she was from Montclair. She was upper crust. Uh, We wanted her to have this kind of hyper white kind of uh, feel. Mm -hmm. And we wanted her to be super clean. So we... And almost clinical at times. Clinical, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. It felt (laughs) almost like uh, you were in a hospital room everywhere she was. (laughs) (laughs) Which is... But it's a testament to her character. You know, she... Her her character uh, represents a safe version, mm-hmm. uh, yes. a safe direction that that Rudy could take, and um, what's safer than 
static, clean, um, no grain, no dirt. Every mm -hmm. it, yes. a hyperbolic version of that was important. But that, you know, this was this is an example of an impossible uh, ask that I that I I, I had um, oh, that she yeah. made Th possible. This is this was this was thinking so far out of the box that I was like, wow. And this is where I loved how you challenged me. So we had a scenario. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> where we had a whole location, the the Brasilia. Um, oh, uh, Jesus, I forgot about this. Right. So you had the the um, so we had the dining side and then we had the bar side and the dining side. I lit all cold, super hyper white. And because all three of his, you know, love interests are going to collide in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, Haley is in this very kind of more clinically based, uh, uh, you know, restaurant, which it's really hard to create that in that kind of space <laughs> because it's all color and warmth <laughs> and all this thing that counteract the shit out of what we were trying to do. <laughs> but I was able to make this really kind of, you know, hyper white environment on one side of the restaurant. And then when he walked to the bathroom and ran into Isabella, um, that side was lit with mica shades and really warm and yes. gold and red tones and everything. And, and we then, were off of the sticks for that. Yes. Yeah. We all went handheld. So you it know. was more fluid. Mm -hmm. and well, yeah. her side was all locked in his side or her side, Isabella's side. So Haley's side all locked, tight. Uh, very tight, you know, mm -hmm. constricted. And uh, we, we used a series of like longer lenses uh, and got back. So it kind of compressed the background. So he felt like he was in a box when he was with her. And then when we went to Isabella's side, we were wider lenses, pushed in close, more intimate. So it's like we already, these rules of engagement of how we would tackle it, not only from a lighting standpoint, not only from a color standpoint, not only from a grain standpoint, it was from a focal distance standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course you can't expect the audience or me to understand any of this. However, <laughs> however, you, f you feel it. 100%. You exactly. absolutely I, feel it. At least, at least I hope that, that people feel a sense of anxiety in certain moments and ease in other moments. And I think that, it's highly attributed to this science. Yes. Um, so if it wasn't enough for me to ask, <laughs> could we give the different characters their own shooting style and color temperature? But could we also make it happen at the same location in the same scene? So he did it. <laughs> he somehow figured out how to do it practically, as he just said. Half of this restaurant. Oh, and do it in the restaurant that I the authentic restaurant that I grew up going to. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it had to be that space. So there was a number of challenges, but he literally split the, the restaurant in half and we divided it with that bar. Right. The island. Half of it was lit and conceived one way and colored one way and the other half another way. And it was all done practically. This isn't some post color exactly. effect or filter. And then you have the piano player who's in the middle who somehow has to embody a little bit of both. He was like this neutral. I don't know how you do it. And I apologize again for putting you through that, but it makes uh, <laughs> What I think is so great sense. about that, and that's like a testament to Shane too, is you really understand the psychological bits because sure, I think studios, executives don't think that those components of filmmaking really matter because it might go over people's head. But I really combat that notion mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. even just as a general audience member, they do feel the nuances between the different color temperature, different focal length. And that's what makes creativity so expressive. And assuming that your audience can keep up is always the best thing rather than thinking they're too dumb to keep up. And I always try to tell that to filmmakers, challenge them, challenge them, try to do things that are nuanced, get into the subtextual like characteristics of cinematography. And I think that was one point when we were watching it a little bit over a year ago, and this is something I would love to hear you talk about, is just composition alone. There's so many great compositional elements, whether it be the transitions, where were those coming from? Were they inspired by previous films? I know you're talking about mm -hmm. Charlie Chaplin, which is a great example of that. But Shane, what was some of the stuff just compositionally you were thinking about with this film? Yeah, I mean, I started watching a lot of, of Rudy's work once, mm -hmm. you know, we said, okay, we're going to go do this. And one of the things that I loved about 
what he had done is so much of what his content was was classic great filmmaking mm -hmm. in camera classic filmmaking that can only succeed if you actually have a plan mm -hmm. right and i'm talking like the simplicity of a match cut which you do not see in movies because it requires us to have a plan from beginning to end right it's not something that can just say oh yeah let's try the match cut thing mm -hmm. it has to go and then then he came to me and he goes all right this this is what i'm thinking with this match cut stuff and i'm like oh my god this is going to give the audience the emotional grind of what you're going through every day and, and how can we accent that? And he goes, well, with the match cut, it's like all of a sudden he's in the the, the uh, kitchen eating uh, breakfast. And then all of a sudden he's match cut to the bus, match cut yeah, to it should all It should all feel like one long piece because the character feels like he's a victim of the situations that he self-perpetuates. Mm -hmm. And that was... If we didn't do a match cut or or a a, a a transition for the sake of it be a practical transition for the sake of it being cool, exactly, uh, it was it was very much to reflect what the character was going through. So when he falls, uh, when he falls in the train state uh, in the train station platform into his bed, it's because I feel that this character feels like they're falling mm -hmm. into bed, and then it's morning. It's like, where did the night go? My life is 10 steps ahead of my brain. Um, and and that that's that's uh, that's something that we had to, as you said, plan for. You know, we never went from A to B no. without some kind of connective musical and visual tissue. Correct. We want you to be a part of this immersive filmmaking community. So we're going to give you $50 off a one-year all-access membership. Click the show notes below and enter the promo code FAPOD50. And I cannot wait to see you within the Filmmakers Academy. All right, let's get back to the podcast. You know, we never went from A to B. No. Without some kind of connective musical and visual tissue. Correct. Um, and I love that. And let's let's get into a practical shoot day for one second, because I think what's so interesting to me is the the musical thread and doing the live music having your sound designer there mm -hmm. um getting the cut that that you and your rhythm specialist i believe shane was telling me the the rhythm yeah, rhythm performer is what we called which is we had to invent that term because what they were doing didn't really they weren't quite dancing they weren't quite playing instruments they were just grabbing forks and knives and brooms and turning it into music. <laughs> so we had to invent a role called rhythm performer. So yeah, cut you it off. never been uh, actually done. And they're extraordinary. They are extraordinary. It's like the best of musical theater, dancing, and rhythm all in one human. Oh, man. When I was going with Jamie and he's like, hey, I'm going to the uh, kitchen supply store down in Newark. And I go... Oh, Wait, what? Yeah, I got it. I'm finding uh, pots and pans that I can tune to the beat. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So he this was, is a whole other level. And this is of like music. It's it was so unique that you're literally finding. And when you when they uh, altered the uh, chopping stations for the fish mm -hmm. that had it when you hit to the side, they added uh, a sound dimension in that. So it had the right tone when they hit it because we were recording everything, everything live. And live. all these performers were were either stompers or ex stompers or from street. Drum corps, they're, they're quite literally the best people in the world to turn any situation or miscellaneous object into an instrument. Um, and you know, we would ask, we'd be asked quite often, like, what's the point in tuning that pot to a B flat? Um, and it's because we we're recording it live. And then the next question would be, why? Um, typically, that's a that's that's something that's done very easily later. Later, uh, why record it live on the day and waste hours? 
Um, yeah, we had pre mics, not pre lights. <laughs> How we, many mics were deployed just to cover a scene? At oh times? man, it was ninety nine like... was the hot, <laughs> was the top. Wait, was there a ninety nine yeah, at one point? Ninety nine. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, I mean, the reason for it wasn't was was to really do what you were just saying was mm -hmm. to try to capture the on the day practical sounds that these items were producing you can recreate them and you can you can refine them of course later but it's just not the same hearing the room and the swing and the energy and it was different every, slightly different every take it was really important that we capture all this stuff we were we were scoring and cap and composing while we were shooting which yeah. is not to be which is is, done. is never done and i was going to say it energetically I imagine for everybody on set, there's such a, because I love energy and that's my obsession, there's such a vibrancy that occurs and actually a shift with live music mm -hmm. that, and and again, I come from a musical background and I love music. I think that, you know, I, I think of a yoga studio just with singing bowls and how it, it mm -hmm. shifts the energy of the chakras. Totally. It's a it, real frequency is a real thing that's emitted when you produce sound and frequency affects yes. matter. It affects matter and and so, and, and and our phys physicality. Yes, mm -hmm. and so having the live music as this was your story and this is who you are. You play music as a musician daily, just like you know, as as part of your artistic outlet. Mm -hmm. um, I think brought an authenticity. I would imagine to what you were trying to convey of what it's like to be you. Um, in a whole different way. And I think that from your standpoint, Shane, it's so complicated because Rudy has so much going on, right? In your head, in your mind, and, and the way that you relate to your environment, let's say, and as a musician. And so that took up a big chunk of the day. Hmm. And then once you got that, once everybody signed off on the music, then your time to shoot it was severely crunched because of the live performance, sorry, <clears throat> performance that was necessary to be authentic to you, Rudy. So it's, it's a juxtaposition. Oh, yeah. It's like when I went into that diner set and uh, they were doing the pre-mic uh, we were, we were told that we had to work outside. So my pre-rigging, pre-rigging team had to do everything outside the first two days because they're in their pre-miking and we didn't want them to, you know, trip on cables or anything like that. And then when I finally went there to kind of start to finesse the pre-light, I went back around the corner cause the, uh, the diner was like a long, and then it had this big eating area that we were able to hide, you know, people in. And I walked in and this, this soundboard was like walking into a master suite at like Warner Brothers. Sound. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell? Right. I thought he was going to lay in like, you know, four shotguns and call it a day. And he's got the cashier. He's like got all these little mics and they've, you know, they re really hid them well to the point where we couldn't see them. Yeah. So that was so like, it really started to, you know, check a lot of boxes of, I've never done this before, yeah. you know? It was the only way in my mind. Oh. I mean, if you're going to claim to want to make a film about that is told through a synesthetic lens where senses are intertwined and you're not sure what's diegetic, what's non-diegetic, exactly. what's in our narrator's head and what isn't, you better mic the shit out of that room. And it's almost <laughs> as if you're capturing reality. If you really think about it, what's happening on that day is right. what the audience is going to experience. Exactly. And you want to bridge that gap because, again, I think the audience can really tell the more you manufacture, the mm -hmm. more you like prune it and manipulate it in post, the more they're going to feel that manufactured process. And I think that really brings the audience close to the story that you both were trying to tell. Yeah, it's to me a difference between listening to a song and watching the song be performed live it's a different energy yeah, and it's a different absolutely. experience and it's more immersive and you can feel the low end inside of your gut um, yes. in a way that n no top of the line speaker could produce no and and the also it fueled the hell out of my team too because you know i wanted to get them 
as passionate about this project mm -hmm. as I was. So, you know, I showed him the sizzle. I showed him as much of Rudy's work that we were doing. So they really kind of understood, you know, I, I said, you got to jump into this guy's mind because it's going to be a fucking hell of a ride. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that was so, um, en engaging and, and people were so invested in it that, you know, I saw ACs trying to figure out when the key grip didn't deliver the the rig that would do, you know, move you into the bed. And the ACs all of a sudden pulling out his little um, Sackler or the Cartoni thing and building this all and making it work. And then you're like, wow, this is they are invested. Mm -hmm. And it really was it was so much fun to when those performers started to oh i can imagine create that percussion it was like uh, i'll never forget it like it brought me back to drumline mm -hmm. i remember being in a tunnel uh and i had envisioned the usc tunnel you know that beautiful you mm -hmm. know hook that the band comes out of and comes <laughs> onto the thing. I thought that's what it was going to be like. So I go to Clark Atlanta where we shot the whole movie and it's literally a hallway like it's in our office. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and it's up to you to, 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 to make that look good. Right. And I was like, Oh my God, how am I going to do this? I go, all right, what if I pack them all into this hallway, create all these little, uh, you know, streaks of light. And then all of a sudden when he goes, walks out and he goes, all right, halftime is game time. And he walks out. And then all of a sudden this stick flies up into the foreground and literally pierces the frame. And then it goes, ka, ka, ka. and then the whole band erupts. <laughs> Everyone around me had earplugs in because, because it was like in that tunnel, it was like, you know, being a projectile of sound, right? It hits you like a wave. And I never put my earplugs in. I wanted to feel that every single time. That's why I can't hear shit now. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, and I don't know if I ever told you this, but Drumline was a film that made me want to join the uh, percussion ensemble when I was in school. No way. Yeah, yeah. I saw that film and I was like, oh, uh, drumming and being in the in the school band can actually be, be cool. cool, right? And I joined percussion ensemble and band. Turns out I was right; it wasn't cool at all. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot cooler in the movie, but. but um, uh, yeah, it was very inspirational drumline to me. So to connect that dot many years later and be able to work with the person who shot it, I mean, it's 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 insane. It's a dream come true. And I also remember you describing that big set piece, that final battle at the end in that stadium. Yeah. And I was like, what was that like being in that stadium with thousands of people in chains? Like, there's no one there. Right. <laughs> it, was like, it, was an, it was empty. There was no one there. I just I I there was all this trick photography I came up with to create the illusion of there being a full stadium with mm -hmm. lights and with the flashing the flashes from the cameras and I couldn't believe it. Between what you did and the sound design, you had you certainly had me fooled. Oh, I love awesome. that yeah, yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. So Rudy, let's talk music for a minute um, because you just referenced it. How many instruments do you actually play? Uh, I don't know. A um, bunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it all started with piano. Piano was like the foundational instrument right. for me. Okay. But through piano, which is technically a percuss percussion instrument, percussion. I, I uh, became obsessed with percussion and drumming. And it was kind of an easy transition for me. And then I picked up a guitar and started teaching myself that, some bass, um, you know, ukulele, uh, forks, uh, brooms, whatever you can find. Yeah, whatever I could find. Do, have you been classically musically trained, or no. is it all self-taught? It's pretty much self-taught. I tried to take lessons, um, piano lessons, and I did them for like maybe a year. Uh, my parents put me in piano lessons, but I just, I was such a poor student. I would never practice, and I had a really hard time learning how to read music. I spent a lot of hours playing, but almost no time practicing. So, mm -hmm. uh, so no, I'm not, although I understand from basic base on a basic level, most music theory, it's all, it's all self self-taught. Um, and it's not, not because I thought it was better than a teacher because I'm trying to be pompous. It was simply because I had a major learning disability. <laughs> I like, could not focus. I, I, I refused to practice my attention as you see in the movie was, um, uh, 
I had a very short lifespan. Um, so yeah, music was just made sense to me as for as long as I can remember. It just made sense as as just a creative outlet, as a as a relaxing. Because yeah. our son, um, I relate to this so much. Our son Miles. I tried forever with music lessons. It was a disaster. He's all self-taught mm -hmm. and he's all self-taught by ear. And, right. and that was me. And yeah, he, he would, hears it and then all of a sudden he's he'll, tuning he'll it and then he'll it. find it. Mm -hmm. I know it. I know very, that very well. Yeah. And, and I find that so extraordinary. And I did the piano lessons, the whole deal, but I don't have that musical gift of being able to teach myself just based on hearing the notes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the authenticity of that is so beautiful. And that's why I want to bring it up because I think that from a very young age, you've been authentically yourself and your, your expression and the way that you creatively express just comes out through music. And I see the same thing with our son where in his downtime, he's just grabbing a guitar and playing yeah. because it's soothing and it relaxes his nervous system, which is so wired. And it just makes sense. It there's makes no sense to there's him. No real explanation or rhyme or reason. It just is. Yes. You couldn't, you couldn't sit me in an orchestra and put a piece of music in front of me. I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, I can't, I couldn't play a single note, but, um, if I hear it, then I can play it back. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so back to the other authenticity question that I have. So having synesthesia, and maybe you could just explain a little bit about this because I think it's so important for people to understand. Do you feel that the movie really captured your authentic experience of living with that and and what has that been like for you um because again your greatest genius your greatest gifts also come with um things that are as you said learning disabilities not being able to focus not being able to concentrate i think that that is hopefully changing for people in terms of acceptance and the way that we do schooling and everything but right. do you feel that the movie really captured that essence of what it's like to live with that that's a, that's a great question um synesthesia firstly for those who don't know is a neurological condition whereby one sense will involuntarily stimulate another sense. Um, you can almost consider it like an intertwining of the senses. And what I didn't realize that at the time that I, I was diagnosed, if you will, um, was how many different iterations of the condition there were. There's like a hundred types of synesthesia and growing. Some synesthetes can taste 14. Some synesthetes can um, smell Tuesday. Uh, it's this really interesting cross-wiring of the senses. The type that I have and I've identified with is what I, I've, uh, based on my research, what I know to be called rhythmic association. This is also another type, linguistic personification, which apparently is very common for, for uh, people who speak multiple languages. Um, mm. They can personify certain inanimate ideas or or numbers or objects. Um, the most common type is chromesthesia. Uh, That's the color one, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where whereby people perceive sound as color and color as sound. So a lot of musicians, like from Etta James to Pharrell to Billie Eilish, have a, a form of chromesthesia, where they don't think of it as C major to B flat. They think of it as blue to yellow. Um, it's super interesting. It's very fascinating. I feel like we're barely, barely scratched the surface of, of what's possible in a synesthetic perspective. But for me, it's like almost like a musical OCD, if you will. Rhythmic <laughs> association is trying to organize sounds, uh, everyday regular sounds into some sort of rhythm or musical foundation. At what age did you know that you had this? Was it pretty young that you had this diagnosis or? No, no that, that happened actually later. And it's because it's not, uh, it's not as commonly mm -hmm. talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And there isn't so much information and evidence to support it. But increasingly now, um, I see more and more of it. I knew that my brain worked in a very interesting way from a very young age. But I just thought that I was a you know weirdo. Um, I didn't know that there was a community of people that shared these symptoms. I didn't know that there was a name for it. I just figured, you know, it sounds are, can be really intense for me. Um, I tried to uh, count everything and turn everything into like a metronomic rhythm. Um, and now I've learned how to kind of cope with it. But mm -hmm. like from a very young age, I would, 
quite literally what you're seeing in the opening scene of the film where I missed an entire conversation was very commonplace. It would happen all the time. Uh, it's probably why I didn't have a lot of friends. Oh my God, I can imagine that in school. How the hell do you concentrate? Just a lot of Fs on the report card. <laughs> <laughs> and then later, you know, I made a lot of friends and, and I, I, I figured out how to cope with this thing. Um, but I was lucky. I, I'm lucky that I was able to turn this weird thing into an asset yeah. And, yeah. and use it to create. And I, to create creative art. And mm -hmm. and how would it impact relationships? Because I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, because that's a good one, because that's what this love story, story is about. Story is about. So let's dive into that. I uh -oh. love that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's that's Scott a tough. Here, didn't it? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. But I'm just thinking parentally. Like to start with your parents, it's like, are you listening? You know, are you paying attention? How mm -hmm. many? Uh, you know, as the parent, right? Thinking that your kid is constantly tuning you out, but 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 they're not. Right. They're they're just in their head. Yeah, I mean, I think at home it was probably the most comfortable place. Um, because you know they're very accepting of and who, so who loving, I was. yeah, and and I uh, they were supportive of the the musical mind and the creative mind. Um, I, I'm thankful for that. Um, it was really everyone outside of home that was the trickier the trickier part. Um, you know, Brazilians I I feel are nat I naturally have a musicality mm -hmm. yes. to them, even the language itself, Portuguese Brazilian. To to the the to the average ear, it actually sounds quite musical. musical. Mm -hmm. um, it does this a lot, uh, and the intonations are really specific. Um, and music is such a heavy part of Brazilian culture that, as far as I think, like my mom was concerned, everything was normal with me. Uh, this is, <laughs> like, of course, I of, of course, you're that. distracted. You know, of course, you're all, you're thinking in terms of music. Who doesn't? Uh, well, it turns out most of the world doesn't. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, relationships were kind of difficult to, were very difficult to to sustain. I didn't think, I don't think I got into my first actual serious relationship until I was in college. Um, and uh, what you see in the film, um, not that Haley and or Isabella are based on real people. They're both based on uh, ideas of people and a culmination of people that mm -hmm. I had relationships with. Um, and it was a serious, it was a serious problem was that it was my attention, it was my focus, uh, still is. Um, but uh, I've, I've got lucky that I've met people in my life who embrace that side of me rather than resent it. That's nice. really important because I feel like there's so much um, culture in itself looks at it very binary. Mm -hmm. I actually had a very similar experience. My mom's Colombian and I would always be in the principal's office because I was tapping, Same. drawing and doing everything <laughs> but what my teachers wanted exactly. me to do. And they're like, listen, Christina, my mom and my dad, we're going to have to hold him back. He's just not formulating in with the students. He's very much by himself. And I was very much a loner. Like I would always mm -hmm. be drawing, playing with stuff, building things. My mom was like, no, that's just his creativity. Exactly. Don't squash his creativity just because he doesn't want, just because he isn't doing what you want him to doesn't mean he's any less valuable to the classroom. Totally. And I think that's really important for people to hear because even today we have such and it's really important. Mental health is super important. But just because you're feeling some stuff, remember, that might be your most creative part of you. Yes. And don't try to squander it because you might not fit in. And I think that's something I actually struggled with later on because I didn't find myself in other people. And I did choose to, like, crush it for a little bit. But I think that's a really important thing. It's look at you, who you found, how to harbor it, control it, make it be part of like one of the best parts of you. And I think that's really important for people to hear. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's why you know, supportive yeah. mothers and, and parents or or, uh, uh, or or those kinds of figures are so important. Um, I mean, I, I was very I was very similar. Everything you just described sounds. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds very and it's funny. hard to go through. It's definitely not easy to go through. <laughs> no, I had a lot of that as well. I didn't have a lot of friends either, and I was, I was always kind of the, the, uh, the oddball, odd guy out, you know. And and I found a a very small collection of friends that were still very, uh, you know, connected mm -hmm. still now. Mm -hmm. uh, but those were, you know, the four or five people in my life that basically was my you know my lighthouse my guiding you yeah. know along yeah. with my my mom understood me a lot more than my dad 
Uh, and my dad, it took so long for him to really, like I would say, hey, I got my newest movie and I got uh, nominated for it and everything. He goes, you know, I just, I, I, I thought you were going to go to Cornell. And <laughs> I, I, I thought you were going to be a, uh, you know, I, I, I thought you were going to be a writer or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, but dad, this is, this is me being a cinematographer and everything. And it took need for speed where I was sitting in the theater with him and he turned to me and he goes, that's a keeper. Nah, and you that, got the approval. And that was the first time I got approval and I was what, 48 or yeah. something. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm still waiting for mine uh, one day. Um, but, uh, I don't know if this was the case for you guys, but, um, it used to be a lot worse. I think as you maybe age and mature and things fall into perspective and you learn how to cope and, uh, uh, you know, I'm able to sit here right now and have a conversation with you guys. But like 10 years ago, I, I would have, you know, general meetings. I'd moved to Hollywood. I signed with, with an agency and I'd go meet with this studio or that production company or that producer. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, your agents call you afterwards, tell you but the, how the meeting went or how the pitch went. Um, like, yeah, yeah, they liked you. They, they, um, were a little bit concerned about your drug problem. I was like, what? I was like, well, you were just, you know, they were, you were clearly on something in the meeting and they were a little bit like, yeah, I hope he's okay. I was like, I'm not on anything. They're like, well, half of Hollywood thinks you have a drug problem because, uh, <laughs> because you don't, you don't sit still. You're always, you you get up on random times and I, I, I couldn't control it. Because um, you can't, you couldn't I sit. And I totally understand. Couldn't sit tapping. I'm, you know, that person yeah. said something that kind of sounded like, you know, it could be a little beat and it's, right. it was a nightmare. People thought that I was out of my mind because I, oh I my that. God. Mm -hmm. I had that quite a bit where people would be like, Brendan, what do you smoke? And I'm like, listen, I'm not <laughs> sober because the way that I think is very much like B to A. And I love going down into these like rabbit holes. And I would always explain stuff and I would get, man, this guy's like trying to be too heady or he's trying to like go mm -hmm. too far with it. And that's always been my biggest criticism. It's like, Brendan, why do you have to be so deep about everything? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, that's kind of just what I want to talk about. But yeah, I got like seven years ago, it would be super hard to even come to this city, which you think it would be the case but i'm like very much a cinephile and just being super expressive about movies be like what's your favorite movie well, i love this about tarkovsky or this about altman whatever it might be and people hate that for some reason i always thought that was so like disheartening for me is the more the like maybe the best way to say it, the more you burn the brighter you are it's really hard for people to adopt that about you sometimes and i think that having and i love this this vulnerable conversation that we're having mm -hmm. because i think what happens so much is that people silence themselves or they 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 don't feel able to fully express which is so painful mm -hmm. as as an artist and as a creative and and we've seen the results of that right? right we have seen the awful results of the suicide epidemic and all of these horrible things happening. So I think that this message is so important to embrace your own path, to, mm -hmm. to realize that all of these unique qualities and differences really mean that there, there might not be a, a perfect path for you to That's follow, right. but you can create your own. And I think Rudy, you've done that so brilliantly, not only with your, your YouTube channel, but, but with this first feature film, to try to break down the walls and the barriers of differences and of, you know, how to be a creative and to show people so vulnerably how to fully be expressed as an artist in a way that feels so true to you as a Brazilian American with synesthesia musician, writer, everything that you do. But it's such a testament to bringing this story to life. And I think, Shane, you have certainly created your own path in, mm -hmm. in s not only on a variety of feature films, but just in your own life, right? As, as an educator, as a working Hollywood cinematographer, as giving back to the next generation. And Brendan, you have as well, you know, mm -hmm. you have, you've had such a unique and unusual path in your life and, and you have created the position that you now inhabit. 
Yeah. Um, and so I think that it this is very important for people to hear. And and thank you so much, Rudy. I think this is a great, very inspiring way to kind of tie all this up. Well, the message uh, of the film is just that: be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. And he is constantly being pulled left mm -hmm. and right and center. Uh, with, you know, no, you need to do this path. No, you need to do that path. And that was something that we as filmmakers wanted to really try to show. So we talked about kind of all the different characters having their, you know, colors and grain and all this stuff. But the mom character, which was played by Rudy's real mom. I love your right? mom. <laughs> and we were like, okay. And he talked to me about this. He goes, you know, my mom was very controlling. You know, she wanted me to, you know, this, this kind of over lovingly Brazilian mom, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That thinks that they're, you know, guiding you down the right path because they just love you so much. Right. And we were like, well, how can we show that not just with dialogue, but how can we physically start to show that? Mm -hmm. And we came up with, and I think this was day one of our three hour, uh, you know, shot listing, you know, brain dumps mm -hmm. <laughs> was this moment of when you fell into bed, because we had all seen these shots. We've all seen the ones where you follow the person like this. Yeah. Right. What's the, is there a name for this, this kind of shot? Uh, like orbital uh, oh, arching because i guess it's technically like there a, definitely a, is a, name. a one a rainbow rig it's yeah, kind of like a the, rainbow shot yeah right. rainbow shot because it's 180 right it's a 180 yeah, yeah. ours is 180 yeah it was yeah. yeah but we've seen it before we've yeah. seen it before but none of those ever moved mm -hmm. so i was like okay so we do this we've seen that it's cool but how can we take it to another level so we did this so, you know, we're, we're, we're horizontal. He falls, we go boom like this. So now the, the image is going like this way, right? Nine by 16, basically. And then we pull out because I've never seen any of those move because they're on this elaborate rig. We were able to put the elaborate rig on a dolly and then pull back and reveal a door that we cut in half, painted black and mom knocks on the door. And Rudy is in bed on the other side. And the way this turned out, so as we started to go back, we spun this way. So when we rotated, she was on top of you yeah, knocking. And we were like, this is a wonderful emotion to show this controlling mom yeah. on top of Rudy. And it's like when we came up with that idea, this is when... I felt that my mind and all the the crazy shit that I've always wanted to to try was like you open the box. And how much and, of that was discovered? I know you guys did a lot of prepping, but did you guys leave room to discover that? Like that shot specifically, did you know what was going to be that going into the day or did you really find that movement on the when day. you were on set? Yeah, I'd say it was a combination yeah. of both. It was yes. it was very well prepared. Yeah. But uh you know, when you on the day, you you notice things, and there are sure. certain uh, obstacles or limitations that yeah, you like to... when the camera went on the side, I tried my best to make sure we had ceiling pieces yeah, and all exactly. that stuff. But then and we create saw the depth off behind the... mom and, and all this stuff. That, yeah, I mean, we saw off the set. We're like, oh shit, you yeah. know, we're gonna have to tilt down more, or or you're just gonna have to paint that shit out. You know, we got so frustrated at one point because we we would nail the scene and get back, and then I'd see off the set, and that was all one move, right? From yes. the falling into to bed pulling out to reveal mom horizontally pushing back in afterwards and going back to the, the other way exactly but and while that was all going on we went from night to dawn to morning <laughs> oh that's right and that <laughs> Because that was done in the studio. Yes. I forgot about that. And while that was going on, my mom couldn't remember the lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. That's awesome. But and all these like cues and that that's what was so what I loved about going on this journey with Rudy is we took a fantastical level of realism. Mm -hmm. And it really from the wonder where, you know, everyone's like, 
I, it was so funny because I remember in a lot of test screenings, everyone's like, what is this? And you know, all this, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, I don't, I didn't understand what that, it was a lot of people kissing and walking through these sets that appeared and everything. And <laughs> I'm like, guys, you got to understand this. We're going into Rudy's mind, mind. Mm-hmm. right? And these are layers. People were definitely confused. Yeah. Oh, they screen. were. De- yeah, it took. But, us- but I, I don't know about you. That excited me. It ex- not that I want to confuse viewers, but anytime somebody sees something, it's like I'm not quite sure how to feel about it. Um, I, I think I translate that as it's fresh. The greatest exactly. films are polarizing and Nicholas Winding Refn. A lot of people always talk about that. You never want people to just love a movie because then they'll forget it. People that say, I love it. I hate it. I really like this criticism. Film criticism is always at the heart of everything. And it's good. And I actually want to talk about that because test screenings are really hard. What were you thinking going into it? And what were you both feeling going out of it and where the film was going to go from there? Just because I feel like not a lot of people talk about just the anticipation of doing a test screening as mm-hmm. a filmmaker. I hated the whole process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a blanket statement. <laughs> I, I, I understand the value and why test screenings are done and why they're important. I, I became a little bit allergic to that process. Yeah. Two reasons. A, it wasn't a proper test screening. We were watching it over our laptops, over Zoom. Yeah. Because of COVID, no one yeah. was in an actual theater. Um, which one could say is even better because they're going to give you the harshest review possible. But I'm I'm relying on this person with their Wi-Fi connection mm-hmm. in their homes who are distracted by God knows what to evaluate my first movie. That's scary. Yeah. Um, so there was that part of it, which I wish we had all been in a theater and judged yeah. it that way where you heard it with supreme sound and a big screen. Um, we didn't get that. But uh, it was highly educational the there was a um uh i think there was like a this like a focus group afterwards with yeah. a moderator where you got to actually hear people talk through it and the more they talked through it the more i realized oh wow they were really actually engaged they were really intrigued engaged they had a lot of questions they enjoyed talking about their concern questions and concerns and that was the more valuable part of the experience um but the part i didn't like about it was the um I guess I guess the uh, the the movie making systemic approach to it, which is like this is what you have to do. This is the conditioning you have to do a test screening, and depending on how it scores, mm-hmm. will determine whether or not you should change things, make editorial changes, do reshoots. Um, I didn't like that it was a test screen that was determining the fate of the film yeah yeah, yeah um, for sure and i also didn't like when i was told by some people like your film's only as good as the test screenings right it's like if it doesn't test well um then the quality must must not be as high as it can be what's the point of making the film you want to make if no one's going to like it um and my answer to that is well i was i, I was being honest that right. I, I, this the film's gonna live forever the review won't um I have to be able to be really proud of this of this thing. So, we this our film tested not great. No, because people were a bit confused. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to tell you that. I, okay, so I'm an empath. I have, a and it sh- got better. By the way, it tested better because we did reshoots <laughs> and all the stuff. And you know, we we but but uh, luckily, the studio and stuff was on board with the test. Is this is more formality and more of an opportunity for us to get a conversation going and pick up on a few things. But by no means does it does it uh, dictate the fate of your film. And I feel for filmmakers who um, who have a more rigid experience because a lot of times test screenings do determine yes. yeah. the film. And I'm do you sorry think to cut you off. No, no. But I think that's so important. And I was going to say when you watch it, there's so much going on mm-hmm. that if you're really in tune and and like I I felt for your character mm. through all of the the tension the anxiety the emotional roller coaster of dealing with these women and his mom i mean I was actually emotionally exhausted <laughs> at the end of this because I was Good. so invested. Oh, that's very nice. In, of you to say. No, but it's really true. And I said to Shane, I'm like, I'm exhausted <laughs> after. And, and, but I think that if you're going on that journey, 
it's a lot to pay attention to. It is a lot for people to understand. And it's, it's a shorter film, too. Right, right. I mean, it's a tight it? 90 minutes, yeah, 91 it's a, minutes. It's 91 tight, minutes. And it's exciting. And, and you feel just such a range of emotions, or at least I can only speak for myself. I did. Right. I did. It was it, it's an emotional journey. And and so I think that's part of the test screening, too. Right. Is every person is coming into it being where they're at and and maybe empathizing more like like myself or mm -hmm. having had a rough day. Somebody else, somebody having had an amazing day and falling in love. So they're like, oh, my God, I love this movie because, you know, it's a love story. Right. Like there's it really depends on where the oh, person's the psyche's mindset, psyche. of, you know, yeah. yeah, where they are. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear, like, do you have a different way that you wish that process could be done? Because I feel like all yes. of Hollywood's under evaluation, a lot of these like legacy systems really do need to be kind of not destroyed, but refined because the directorial perspective, I feel like has been closed or hampered so much by committee based mm -hmm. filmmaking. Yeah. I would love to hear what your approach is. Well, uh, the, once the film's out there and yeah. you know it's released, the truth is it's none of my business yeah. anymore. It's it's actually not not mine anymore. It's it's yours and whatever it makes you feel and whatever you have to say and whatever criticism, um, I, I embrace. I, I mean, I, I I made videos on the internet for years. I've been called every single <laughs> name you could possibly imagine. Um, nothing offends me. I, I I know I made the best thing that I could with what we had, and that'll always be true. Um, I wish that we tested the film in a theater, though. I wish that yes. uh, all the, these you know hundreds of people got to see this film for the first time with pristine sound and and visuals, and not you know on a laptop or phone in their bedroom or dorm room. Yeah, um, that's no way to to watch a film for the first time. No. And, and the feedback we got, you know, remember when they were like, well, you know, people are not liking Rudy so much. And we, yeah. Need yeah. And I was like, good. That's a point. I don't like myself either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we're like, but that was a big, that was a, that was a big one. Yeah. A big one was like Rudy, was, Rudy's likability. Exactly. Like, and then suck. all of a sudden Diego's through the roof. We need more Diego. Right. <laughs> and then we had to dream up more scenes with Diego, mm -hmm. right? And we actually, you know, in our pickups where we went in, we shot a lot of uh more with the puppet Diego. Yeah, yeah. With, yeah. with with that. So that was that was a win. Like mm -hmm. good things come from test screens, yeah. of course. They're they're valuable. I just don't I didn't love that this big, style. This this style. Yeah. It would have been nice to have been in a theater. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. And had a real conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, moving forward, you're going to see a lot more of what you just experienced mm -hmm. because it is expensive to do all these things. Totally. And, and now, you know, now that streaming has really taken hold and the theater uh, going perspective is, is on the downturn, which is unfortunate, um, you're going to start to see that the small screen is where they're going to be experiencing it. And this, and your movies got to, perform well on that small screen because that's yeah. the, the captive audience. And, you know, I start to think about, you know, when we, when we go to make movies, it's like we have three minutes to grab the audience now with the streaming platform. When you're you, you in a, used, used to be 15, 20. Yeah. When you're in a theater, you're kind of in there. You've, you've got your popcorn, you've <laughs> sat <laughs> down, committed. you've committed, you've obviously gotten in your car and gone to the theater. And now, you know, you're for you to pull out at that point. That's right. It's, it's a little more difficult. It's like, I think about, I can count how many times on my, on both hands, how many times I've walked out of a movie theater. Right. But how many times have you jumped from seeing a trailer or the first two or three minutes of a film. And then you say, screw this. I'm going to something else. Yeah. On streaming or on digital. You yeah. Mean? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely made that, that uh, level of investment um, lower. Exactly. Lower. Yeah. And I think the way Rudy conceptualized the film, it starts with a humdinger mm -hmm. like it starts with like 
oh my God, what am I on a ride for? <laughs> That's a very right? nice, optimistic way of putting it. Some people might might watch the first two minutes and be like, I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we are so excited for, um, and, and again, congratulations. Just to reiterate for everybody, Amazon has uh, Amazon Prime, Prime. Mm-hmm. the yep. 4th of April, right? Mm-hmm. April Is- 4th, Prime Video. Prime video. So go and watch this incredible, incredible film. I know I'm prejudiced, but it was a wild ride, Rudy. And we so appreciate your time being here. Oh, I've had a blast. Sharing. Are we done already? I have so so much more to say. (laughs) Oh, we we can keep on going if you want. I'm kidding. That's enough, Rudy, for one day. It was. It was amazing. And thank you, Shane, for your incredible creative perspective. Oh, you're so welcome. And Brendan for being my awesome co-host today. Amazing co-host, Bob. Yeah, Yeah, he's awesome. (laughs) And that concludes this episode of the Inner Circle Podcast.